Hello and welcome to the skating lesson. I'm Dave Lees. And I'm Jonathan Beyer. And, and we want to welcome back our favorite, Sandra Bezik. Sandra, welcome back to the skating lesson. Fun. Thank you. I'm you know, happy. you're an Emmy Award winner, you know, <laughs> director of Star and Ice, and a regular um, contributor to the skating lesson now. <laughs> and my favorite. That's yes. all. Okay. <laughs> so you've been doing a little blogging. So. I We've enjoyed your post, so we thought that we would get your take on kind of the ice dance event and what was going on with all of the, that creativity last night on the ice, on the judging panel, all of it. So, oh, on the ice, I mean, you know, Tess and Scott, like they completely blew me away, and I, I think Tanith got it right when she said that. Papadakis and Suzeron were the artists, then the competitors. For Tessa and Scott, it was the other way around. They set their goal and they went after it. And you could see that the whole season. And I think I tweeted it, their tra trajectory, you know, was just like this. And um, they really controlled the narrative right from doing both events in the team competition. It was, they were going to own this and they, they used all that experience um, and just put it to work and every single little box was checked off and they weren't going to let anything get in their way it was it was pretty amazing now knowing them as you do we know that Scott is openly competitive but is Tessa just as intense and here I mean I don't know them that well but I would I, I, yeah I mean, she hides I, it better yeah I thought she was so on fire at the beginning of the program of the free dance I, I had never seen her that cranked um and that's competitive <laughs> yeah. I, there was a, a fierce aggressiveness about it that was exciting in one way and such a stark contrast of course to the french yes um, <clears throat> it, it was literally fire and ice <laughs> well, you know what yeah. i was thinking i think it, I, I thought it was fire and air mm. and okay um, you know, or, well, I mean, I'm not going to go along with the corny, you know, <laughs> completion of that analogy, but, um, but it was fire and air. And I think at the Olympics, if you're competing against fire, it's really hard to be air. Mm. Yeah. You can win if you're air and there isn't anyone else close to you, right. but in that direct comparison, um, Tess and Scott controlled it. And then, of course, the horrible luck of the, of the short dance in the dress. I have a question for you guys. When did the rule change where you can't stop? Uh, yeah, before the production, yeah, it would have been just as bad had they stopped and then skated cleanly. Almost. Yeah. Because they were two points behind, right? And it's a point deduction right. to disrupt the program. I think within the last two seasons, right? It's yeah. a three-point deduction, but I think or it was. Um, but I know in 2010, when Nobunari Oda stopped, it was a deduction then as well, because he had the boot problem. Why? I think I'm it's watching. a Tanya Harding rule, but I think it's unfair. Okay, so my issue with the rules is it's some of the rules. is a, So many of them are put into place to combat cheating. It's like, it's okay. You're doing this because you're cheating. Right. And in fact, hurts the rest who never intended to cheat in the first place. Had she been able to just stop and do up the damn dress, wouldn't that have been better? Right. She mm -hmm. wasn't cheating. Nobody intended to do that. But instead, it was a complete distraction and simply, you know, horrible, horrible luck. Right. I, I think that that should happen at the Olympics. I agree. I think it should be up to the ref to make that discretionary call in that moment, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, what if the dress really did fall down? You know, like, I mean, and it's- Which it almost, it yeah. actually almost no, did. No, but you. I think it did. There was totally I, I think, I didn't see yeah. any CBC coverage, but the CBC covered the, the host broadcast, picked mm -hmm. up the host feed. And um, I think there was a lot more there. And then they showed a slow-mo. I mean, this is all from the host feed. And, you know, the NBC and the producer, uh, Rob Hyland and the team, they were just thinking on their feet and, you know, pulled back wide and protected her. And I just thought that was such a 
smart. Obviously, they're you know fantastic producers, but it was just a smart and classy thing to do. But um, it didn't happen in the rest of the world, from what I understand. I didn't see it. I don't want to look. I don't want to find out. Yeah, I mean, I just heartbreaking for him. And there, and there was something <clears throat> people were discussing on how it was actually attached in the mm -hmm. back. Um, because in, in that quick moment, as it just happened in that opening pose, you know, that opening standstill movement, you wondered why he just didn't latch it real quick for her and continue. But apparently, it was much more involved than that and involved being sewn each time. I, I wasn't really understanding. Well, I, I think it was all of the above. I saw a little bit of an interview from Marie France, and I, I think that there were, you know, clasps, and she was sewn in. And Marie France, I think, thought that he had grabbed her a little bit to, you know, on maybe on the wrong angle or something and like ripped it. Um, she had worn the dress all season. Right? Exactly. So, you know, mm. and, and yes, these things happen and it, it shouldn't be just tough luck, honey, deal with it. Not in a case like that. I right. Because we and, do know some skaters where if that had happened, you would give a little bit of side eye because you knew they needed to stop because of something, but something so innocent. I think anybody would have themselves. But yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, just because, you know, there is suspicion around Tanya Harding doesn't mean the rest of the skaters never, ever, ever think like this have to pay the price. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They hadn't even popped a lot. Let's it was just the base, Yeah, and let's not base marks on, on you know, the suspicion of judges and skaters cheating. Mm. Right. Right. Yeah, I think with, you know, it feels, I don't want to say that it feels empty because I think that Tessa and Scott were so fantastic. But if you look at the how the event was judged, if not for that costume malfunction, the entire event would have been completely different. Um, that said, I do find it, I do find that the results are really frustrating because obviously if your costume is falling down you're not giving a hundred percent in the performance understandably which is the fault of the rules to begin with but then you're judging someone who's giving a performance while they're holding up the dress and that's not tens for me because oh, how could it be with that that was judging on reputation on mm -hmm. ability on practice on not on the moment mm -hmm. right in my opinion mm -hmm. so um you know, it, it was just unfortunate. It was unfortunate that everybody was put in that position and then, you know, kind of surprising that those marks mm -hmm. came out. Mm -hmm. Right. You do, do wonder. I mean, at the end of the day, um, because I think, well, I mean, certain, I don't know. I mean, I think the majority of people would agree with the final result, maybe not necessarily the ins and outs of how to get there, the whole thing will remain a rumbling, mm -hmm. right? as opposed to a big, huge um, crisis. Yeah. Right. And I feel that, you know, that rumbling is, it, it, it's not that DDA or anybody else managed to um, hijack the event. It's the fact that we're still talking about that potential. That's to me what's so upsetting, and um, I don't like upstaging the skaters that way. I just, I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, well, I it's wrongly. It's a, sorry, it's a detractor from their skill and their craft, and and it's so tough because there are very fanatical fans for Virtue and Moyer. They've been around for a very long time. They've created quite a devoted following. And I believe that there is a way to support Virtue and Moyer and not not promote cheating on the, from the French Federation without slamming the ability of the French. And that's tough for me because as an artistic soul, I respond maybe a little bit more aesthetically at times to the French and to that airy quality versus that fire quality that you're talking about. Just completely subjective. I just happen to prefer that. But I don't understand why <clears throat> in 
promoting Virtue and Meyer, there has to be a bit of vitriol for the French because that's not on them. They're doing the best they can. If you have a problem with their federation or if you have a problem with the judging or something else like that, it really has nothing to do with the skaters themselves. Yes. Yeah. You know, why, why, I mean, I don't think the president of the federation should be judging an event mm -hmm. from any country. Yeah. Period. It, it, this is not a criticism of anybody's judging. I just think the optics don't have to say. I think the system should protect the integrity of the judges. I think the system would be wiser to not put any judge on the panel who you can question in that way. I mean, and then the judge should be allowed then to place the skater wherever they believe with their knowledge and ethics and, you know, all of that and experience and personal taste. But we should be protecting that position so that we can trust that position, trust their judgment, instead of questioning it because of, um, you know, bias. Right. I mean, there's always bias, but I'm talking about unethical bias. Yeah. And I, I think it's... Yeah, a personal bias. You yeah. may have a judge that prefers a yeah. certain type of skating, but when it's when it's nationalistic, it, it's real tough. I mean, my question is: Do you find that the the ISU in general is lacking in the amount of judges from from the pool in which they can choose? Is is that part of the problem that they're kind of stuck with a limited amount that really qualify for judging at this level? And and maybe, and I don't know that. I don't it's a pretty know. thankless position, I would think. None of these people are paid. None of these people, you know what I mean? It's a terrible position to put her in. Yeah. Because, you know, she's, she's damned if she doesn't, and, you know, she doesn't um, right. place them properly. Or play, play, place, you know, so-called favor the national um, theater. But, uh, I mean, I, you know, sitting back and watching it all, I was just thinking, you know Maybe with all of these changes in the sport and the progress and all of that, I mean, maybe we are ready for professional judges. Maybe we are ready. I mean, I know I don't know much about hockey, but I've been told that it, there, there was a huge amount of resistance for um, the international uh, referees um, to be professional. And, and, you know, nobody wanted it, and they were all from the countries, and there was all this bias, and people were always complaining. And then um, they, they uh, made them all professional. And the, it seems like the community likes it better. Okay. Um, you know, you know, you're just a professional adjudicator. Um, it, I'm just throwing the concept out there. You know, I'm, I'm adding to the noise, and I know that there's a ton of noise always right. around our sport. Hmm. It's just a thought. No, I think it's an interesting thought, and I don't, I don't even know how it would work or anything, but I think... Yeah, because I have so many. When I went through and I highlighted all of the judges that made that gave me pause between the two events, it was the majority of the panel. So I thought this is ridiculous, and it was going in both directions, every direction, four directions, and I thought this is getting a little ridiculous. So, well, especially. And, sorry. Go ahead, Sandra. Well, I was just going to say, and it's, it's it's historic in the dance event, mm -hmm. so you can't help but worry about it. Right. <clears throat> and all the IJS changes haven't fixed that. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, yes, there's more criteria. Yes, I think IJS system has improved ice dance the most, in my opinion. I think, you know, it's so great to have something tangible to actually compare. Um, but, um, I don't know. <laughs> I do the 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 interesting thing is when they talk about um, <clears throat> the IJS judging of components and things like that, in dance particularly, <clears throat> the amount of 10s, the amount of 9.75s are, are so much larger than in any other discipline. And again, I think you said in um, the last time you were on the show, the ice dance field is an embarrassment of riches. It is so deep, and there are so many wonderful teams doing such different but interesting things. Now, do we think that everyone's score needs to be up there, that every time needs to be a world record, that every time, you know, 
things in the nines, the high nines and tens, are classified as quote unquote historical performances. And oh, I know that. Okay. like things that I just don't know if all the time that these nine seven fives and tens are being posted, that these are the clips that I constantly go back to YouTube to watch necessarily, you know, and that's, and that's my fake judging criteria is, am I going to add this to a playlist of YouTube programs that I want to watch over and over again, this program in this event? And I don't know that that's always the case, but. <clears throat> well, I will say that last night I would add the top two performances to my list and I would have given them both the row of sixes or tens. And I feel that there is something lost that last night that they didn't have rows of sixes come up because I think they were both worthy of that and I think it would have added more than these jumbled numbers because I've noticed that this week I go into the office, people are talking about Adam Rapon. Now, unfortunately, the last group is on too late here that many people don't see it, but I that's do true. think that if a row of sixes happened, that's something to wake up to other than just the Canadians win. That's like, right. oh, you see it. But if you see a row of sixes... You might click on that link and sit and say, oh, let me watch that. A row of sixes. That's, you know, interesting. Yeah. And I think that it loses a little bit something there. I mean, even in the that's headline, as cheesy or cheap as you want to say that we're unsophisticated, old school, old fashioned. I think it misses it's something. Honest. It's 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 honest. And it, it was organically ours. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, that branding that we had was so important. I'm not talking about the system. I'm talking about the experience of witnessing that declaration of stopping the world to say, folks, we just witnessed something. We just, like Torval and Dean, Sevchenko and, and Mazo the other night, like, didn't that deserve the world to stop? <laughs> <laughs> And that has nothing to do with IJS. It has nothing to do with systems. It's, it has to do with um, our former ability to captivate um, the world beyond the skating fan, beyond the super fan, and, and have them instantly care. Torval and Dean, um, you know, as we all know, were our genius. They also built a career around the concept of perfection in 6.0. I mean, it, you know, it was, they deserve to. But so do the skaters today. Right. And, and that, was, that was really the um, impetus of me, you know, scribbling. Now, you know, I'm an amateur writer. I, I don't think I was articulate enough in, in this last post to really, I, I don't think I let people into my brains quite as much because I wasn't, I didn't intend to criticize the IJS. It wasn't about IJS. It was about that experience that I used to have. I've been to nine Olympics. I've seen a few things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've seen the differences. And I'm not arguing IJS. I'm just pining for skating to um, own the world stage more than we do now. Yeah. And I still think that all these skaters, Adam, all of these people have fought through, you know, this, I think NBC has done a fabulous job of, um, of, of promoting the events and promoting the, the personalities. And I actually, in retrospect, think that the team event really helped with that because it set this it certainly set the stage for Tess and Scott. I mean you guys didn't have any of Tess and Scott in your promos. You guys meaning NBC. I mean, you know, Canada of course is inundated um with, with Tess and Scott and rightly so. But in the States there was nothing, no mention of Tess and Scott in the promos. But then all of a sudden the team event I was like, whoa, who are these people? Oh yeah. Whoa, whoa. That lift. You know, I mean, all of that stuff. And it was sexy and sensual and adult and, you know, they were captivating. And and so then that then created their momentum. Right. Um, but it's that much more airtime for them, for people yes. to be acquainted and anticipate. Yes. And, like, and yeah. that's what you want anyone who also plans to build a career from this 
and continue promoting skating. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's just, oh, turning pro and cashing in. No, every single one of these skaters who, who has turned pro has in some way um, contributed back. You know, the, the Scott Hamiltons and the Christy Yamaguchis and the, you know, Brian Boyton, like all of them. I mean, I'm, and Torben Dean. It's, 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 they've kept our world going and kept us, um, and it's just so important to keep that accessibility. And I'm on a little bit of a rant now, but I, I got an email from a former world champion who hadn't been, who was working there and who hadn't um, been to Olympics since Salt Lake. Um, he certainly knew what he was talking about and, and his, his, you know, blown away by the progress, technical, obviously he's been watching it all these years. But the one thing that he said that really struck him was that the system right now seems to put up barriers between skaters and the audience and that they have to fight those barriers, you know, whether it's the confusing world records or, you know, he just felt it was his takeaway that the skaters had to work harder to reach. I agree. Well, and it's interesting, in some of the PCS criteria, also they talk about projection. Mm -hmm. And it's a big thing that I find is is missing sometimes in, in this era of skating is that projection. And <clears throat> Dave has aptly pointed out in the past that, you know, this is not the era of a million shows, of a million ice shows and a million competitions where people are really honing that projection skill and instead are in in each and like trying to like focus, you know. But I would add to that and say mm -hmm. performance is only one piece of the component. Right. It's, and I would take performance, maybe, and make it its own little category for that, you know. I mean, I've said this for years, that magic, to award that magic. Movement. And I think that, you know, uh, I just remember when IJS first started, how shut down the competitors were because it kind of didn't really matter. Right. As long as you do your jump, as long as you, um, um, you know, get your your checklist going, that that last little bit kind of didn't matter. It didn't matter if you made mistakes. It didn't matter. Get those numbers. Get those numbers. And um, so, in that regard, I would like to see a greater value to creating that. Moment. Yeah, you know, because we are we are not we are a sport. We are an art, theater. We're we're dance. We're we're before, we're everything, and let's not deny any of it. And I well, I and, but uh, you know, having said all of that, I think there were some unbelievable performances mm -hmm. um, already, like just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. What it, you, oh, sorry. So, so, sorry. Yeah, what I was going to say is one of the interesting things about these Olympics, because it's live, is that so many more people seem to be watching for probably a myriad of reasons. Yes. And, and that's really, really helpful. And I know I was cranky at the beginning because I felt really bad for the skaters. I thought, who ha skating at 10 o'clock in the morning? I mean, that's brutal. I don't care who you are. I don't care what time you get up. It's 10 o'clock in the morning in an empty house, you know, and we all know what at matinees feel like, and this isn't even a matinee. Now... You know, I'm sort of buying into it because the, the, I mean, live is always better. And, you know, maybe the kids just went over there and stayed on uh, North American time. Well, that's what, that was my only, my yeah. only justification for that. With all the jet lag, you can now adjust to any time you want. So keep getting up at four and go to bed at eight. You know, I mean, there, there could have been a way, yeah, I think. Part, of the, village, part yeah. of the village with. I can imagine. Yeah. circus going on it would be easier to world championships um but i think going live really matters the only the only issue i have with some of the nbc live coverage is we were missing especially in the dance like for instance chalk and Bates, <clears throat> who obviously had a slip and slide moment in the free i was it happened so fast and you wonder what just happened 
And then because of their live coverage and because of their balancing with the things, we're missing out on a lot of slow-mo replays. And right. that, that is something as a super fan, I very much miss. I want that slow-mo and I want to see exactly who clicked who and what happened here. And I want to see certain things it replayed that we are unable to see that. And, and that was a bit of a tricky, a tricky thing to navigate for me. Right, but you have to consider the number of people in the world who are super fans. Right. And the number of people in the world we really need to be reaching. Mm -hmm. Right. In order for our sport to grow, right, and for our sport to be promoted, and so I think that that's a really fine trade-off. And you know, for the super fan who really wants to know, there's there's ways of going back and, and looking at it, not in the moment, right. Um, you know, and, and calling live is 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 really tough that way too because you, in many respects, you can't get in depth. And and that's that's the balance. I mean, you know, you, but I think live is worth it. I really do. And it's you know what? It's worth it for these kids. I call them kids. Well, they are. Let's be honest. I want to ask I, you, oh, Mama. I want to ask you something about pro skating back in your era because obviously people they started competing against one another. And the thing that I think about is each Olympics, there are a lot of skaters who are still doing shows that are in pretty good shape and that are still viable. And I, I mean, a lot of them are in Asia, but okay, do a competition in Asia and invite Mao Asada to compete against Miki Ando. And if Yuna Kim wants to come, she is more than welcome to come and have, uh, you know, Daisuke Takahashi and, you know, who knows if Hanyu will compete again. But, you know, these are men that are viable, that are skating. Were the pro skaters afraid to compete against each other early on? Because now it feels like people win and they're afraid to tarnish that. Well, at the beginning they were because mm. of of um, tradition, because mm. because they thought there was something to lose there, and then the big guns of that certain era stepped up, mm. and it was really fun, you yeah. know, for, for those years when you had Brian and Kurt and everybody, and they were out there, you know doing big stuff. I mean, Christy would go out and perform almost close to Olympic content for her. Mm -hmm. And, and that, um, it worked, it reached an audience. Um, and, and it was beautifully done. I mean, the world pro in Landover, Dick Button's event. And I tell you, you know what the rules were? I mean, the rules were fabulous. <laughs> The length of your music. Um, try not to choose music that's too long. Um, pre present a well-balanced program. Focus technically in you know the first half, artistically in the second half. Remember that a well-balanced artistic program still has to have technical elements to be of value, right. and vice versa. <laughs> and that was kind of about it. <laughs> so Sandra, this is what we need to do. You need to present this to the Canadian broadcasters. Tessa and Scott can compete against Marilyn Charlie. And, <laughs> and. No, I mean, I don't know. I, I would have to wrap my brain around all of that because, um, I mean, the, I don't know whether it's because I'm engaged with the Olympics. I'm figuring everybody is. Mm -hmm. um, I'm figuring that. You know, I don't. I haven't looked at ratings to see if they're up or down. I'm sure they're like through the roof here in Canada because of Canadian team and and Tess and Scott and um, you know and, and tonight the ladies. Um, but I don't know what engages beyond that right now. I don't know what kind of skating it is mm -hmm. that will engage the audience and whether. Um, I mean, clearly competitions, other competitions haven't mm -hmm. engaged the general public in recent years. Um, so I don't know what it is, what the magic course potion is for um, 2018 and beyond. And this, and this happens in classical music a lot, is who are you catering to and to what standards? 
at what point are you selling out just to get a few more numbers? And at which point are you holding to your integrity, but it's it's too esoteric really for a lot of people to get. But you know, when I watch with people, especially something like I stands, um, and, and this has happened quite a bit with, I very much viscerally respond to Hubble and Donahue. I, especially when I see them live, there's just, there's energy bursting through them and there's big, powerful sweeping skating, especially in their pattern in, in the short dance and things like that. And then you see other people uh, that don't, they don't get it. And it doesn't mean they're supposed to get it and are incapable, but I just, especially in ice dance right now, oftentimes I'm like, how are we watching the same thing? I don't, you know, and it's hard to know how we cater, um, we as a choreographer, <laughs> no, but like, how, how does the sport cater and balance that super fan and, you know, casual viewer? It, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. You're going to lose the super fan. Okay. Yeah, you're very, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It is our responsibility to look beyond. Right. With integrity. Right. With integrity, with creativity, with um, bravery. You know, I, I, which is, you know, that's how you grow the sport. I, I mean, I, you know, God, like there's, there's so much to it and nobody has the answers. Nobody has all the, you know, reasons why we fell off. Um, I mean, there's a multitude of reasons. Um, but it just sitting here watching the Olympics after 24 years, because the last time I was sitting, I was, you know, eight months pregnant, um, <laughs> has given me an opportunity to just think, right. just respond and think in, in no official capacity. And then, of course, as frustrated as hell. So I had to channel that instead of just feeling sorry for myself that I wasn't at the Olympics. It's like, okay, no. What does it feel like to be here? And you know, what am I thinking? And what have I learned? And what have I seen in the past that we could use for the future? You know, it's not about pining for the past. It's not that. Like, I'm not one of those people who you know says, "Oh, back in our day, you know, things were better." No, you know, it. There's always going to be progress, and you want to be part of that progress. You want to go with. It. You don't want to, um, you know. Be cranky. Yeah. So well, I'm not interpreted. I mean, you know, I hope that it's scary to put yourself out there, as you guys know. Yeah. Um, it's really scary. And then, you know, and then I'll go back and hide under a rock. Um, <laughs> I, I'm really, really shy. <laughs> I am. I mean, it's sort of this dichotomy. You know, I think me pushing out is is still back from, you know, my mom pushing me out into the ice. You well, know. They, they always say for great artists, there's a Venn diagram and it's like crippling self-doubt and like outrageous self-confidence and in the middle is where artists lie you know it's where they it's where they cross but I'm curious from your standpoint like for me someone like Piper and Paul <clears throat> for example um, I have always enjoyed their skating and I have always enjoyed their innovations and their attempts to be funky and go outside of the norm. And, and they're ones that I think don't always get the credit for that. So are, are there certain dancers that may not be placing as well, but they're like, I don't want to say guilty pleasures, but like, like really people, yeah. yeah. I really enjoyed their bond last night. And, okay. um, I thought it, it had, I thought to me it was more film noir than Bond because yeah. there wasn't the um, sexual tension between them right. that um, a Bond, you know, femme, fat, femme fatale, whether she's the good one or the bad one, you never know. I mean, that was sort of the concept when I um, suggested the Bond girl to um, David Wilson for uh, uh, Yuna's short program for Vancouver, um, you know, it's like make her so that you don't know if she's the good one or the bad one. Dangerous in a way. Dangerous. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So theirs was more of this danger like a film noir, like she was mysterious, but there wasn't the sexual tension. But I really, really liked it. I really liked that it would, it, they didn't, they didn't sell, you know, they weren't. 
selling. They just skated, and they're, they're, they're such beautiful skaters. I did enjoy them. I thought they, it felt very modern to me, and modern approach to a free dance. Right. Well, and it's interesting because even in, I'm sad to say, in the 2013-14 season, uh, the Le Petit Prince or whatever that the French were doing and they ended up fourth, it was subtle and it, was, it took me too long to get it. And I felt like that was an example where the Russian pair doing a very showy, glitzy, obvious Swan Lake was, was easier to understand. But ultimately in time, I much prefer what the French were doing. You know, when you're choosing the material... You have to consider your audience, the moment, right? Or your motivation, also, I suppose. Are you going for an easy sell that gets you a win, or do you believe so strongly in this more subtle message that you're sending and you just stand by it? I mean, I guess that's also, in a way, even Tessa and Scott changing the end of their. Right, right. Rouge. Obviously, they needed to make a shift. They did it. It was totally the right move and created the moment by swinging it a little bit more. It's not meant as a slam, but a little bit more obvious, a little bit easier to understand. Right. But I don't think Preston Scott, yes, their motivation was to win. They absolutely said that all year. You know, yeah. They put themselves on the line. But... Their motivation to choose Moulin Rouge was something different. It was like, it was because, I mean, I saw them backstage at Stars on Ice when they were just looking for music. And, you know, they, they mentioned it to me and said, you know, but nobody likes it. And, you know, it's been used. And, and you know, I thought, well, yeah. <laughs> <That's Correct. awesome. laughs> Yeah. If it speaks to you, if it moves you, if if you really want to do this music, damn it, do it. It's your Olympics, right? And you know, make it fresh. Make it make me feel like I've never seen it before. But the other thing too is um, the world hasn't seen Milan Rouge on the ice a gazillion times. This is for, this is their first time. We all have. Yeah. Milan Rouge felt way fresher. Than Moonlight Sonata. I thought, yeah. It was contemporary to the general public. I don't think um, Tess and Scott took that in, into consideration. I think they just really wanted to interpret this piece of music. They wanted to be a man and a woman. I mean, they wanted to. Exp I, I, mean, I did an interview today about you know the, Tess and Scott and their their progression and 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 you know, the sexuality, sensuality on the ice. And I said, but I mean, my, eight years ago, they couldn't have done that. Right. They drew from all their life experiences these past eight years so that they could do this. So, you know, it takes time. And it, it, it just, it was natural and honest, that progression. That's why it worked. If it, if it was forced and chosen specifically just to win and, you know. Put on, yeah, hard, exactly. Integrity. I think they came with huge artistic integrity, okay. and they were the hunters. And it, yeah, I felt like yeah. they were the hunters here, and it worked with the fire of the music. And somehow, the French, I felt like, had their performance of the season at the Grand Prix final, where I really felt like it moved me. And somehow, last night, as beautiful as it was. It didn't feel as contemporary, and maybe it was the skate order, but I just felt it was the... If you had to pick what was a little bit flat last night, I, I if I had to choose, I would have gone to St. Scott. And, and I thought the French were wonderful, but I felt like last year's music felt more current. You know, last year at the World Championships when they skated, that woman was shown crying in the audience, and I didn't feel the same way this year, for whatever reason, at the last moment. I think too. It didn't help that. Um, I it didn't. I didn't seem like the audience responded to them in the, in the building. Um, and it, the I, I don't know that for sure. That's that was my take. That they went nuts for Tess and Scott, and they were polite for for the French. I'm not sure that's true. Um, but I felt that it somehow didn't necessarily 
the Olympic audience is a very specific audience too. It's, it's, you know, a way more of the, um, casual fan as opposed to the educated, you know, Boston world's audience. Like everybody knew what they were watching. Right. Um, so that particular audience would, um, an Olympic audience would, might lean towards something that's more in your face um, than something as subtle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you, you can argue against that. I mean, God, and skating, you can argue against any point you make, yeah. right? And we do. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because, you know, the whole season has been dominated in ice dance by this discussion between the French and the Canadian. But really for me... Uh, in several points in this Olympics, I'm very curious about that bronze medal because that to me has in so many ways been so much more of a wild card. So it was yeah. exciting when Megan and Eric did that. I was, you know, thrilled with the men's podium, although that was a bit more expected in, from my point of view. This one, I think many people on paper anticipated the Shibutani's potentially doing this, but you know, there was that part of me that really appreciates, but again, the subtlety of Hubble and Donahue, and it was it was a bit more heartbreaking to me to see to see that uh, elude them in, yeah, in the yeah. free dance. That was it, tough. It was heartbreaking, and, and I, they don't become fragile competitors because you know when that starts to work on them. Not too many fourth place finishers at the Olympics you know, just fly right past it. And, and you know, I, I mean, for many fourth place finishers at the Olympics, it can become a whole thing. They oh, did they end up fifth? No, they fourth. were fourth. Yeah. Oh, oh. Pewter, Sandra, pewter. We don't do that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Leave it to us. <laughs> they were fifth in the free. That's um, right. But I would... Yeah. How many times, I mean, in all of your years of skating, and not an exact science, but they've had two really big moments where they've dropped the ball now. Two, well, and they've had, you know, smaller opportunities, Grand Prix finals, things, you know, Grand Prix events, things like that. But the big moment of the year, world championships, uh, you know, at what point can they still recover? You know, is Worlds kind of the test? If they don't do it at Worlds, is it never going to happen? Like, at what point do you start to get concerned that it's going to become you know, a broken record for them. Yeah. I've also been around long enough to never rule out anybody. Mm -hmm. It's all what's going on in their hearts and their brains and their bellies. And, um, I mean, look at Mirai. Look mm -hmm. at me. You really can't count out anybody until they make the decision. Mm -hmm. um, and I still think they have so much to say yeah. That, uh, you know, I hope yeah. that they turn it around at Worlds and um, learn from it and all that stuff. Um, was this their first Olympics? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what happened at the World Championships? First Olympics, folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, what happened at Worlds when they were third um, after the short and then really plummeted, this was less of a plummet. Right. And, and yeah, like, let's, let's stop for a second. This yeah. is a little bit of my, you know, my Nathan Chen thing. Um, they're fourth at their first Olympics. Yeah. Period. Tara was first. I mean, you know, it's also there. All right. But it's a, it's a little different. Having been there, not at that level, but being 15 at the Olympics. It's a little different because at that age, there's a confidence and an, an oblivion to yeah. all of this. Yeah. For women, you know, for girls, it hits a little later, 16, 17, 18, when you start getting all insecure and all of that stuff is happening. At 15, you're like, you know, you've got the world, you know, in the palm of your hand. Um, guys, it's different. I think guys never kind of have that you know, because they're just all, you know, <laughs> puppies until yeah. they're like 20. Okay. And then 
between 20 and 26, you know, usually it's around 23, 24, they really seem to hit their prime. Now again, you can argue anything that I've just said. This is my experience of what I see. Um, not to take away anything from Tara at all, but right. she was also not the favorite. Hmm. As world champion, she was whatever she was. Michelle was the favorite. She had the gift of not being the favorite going into the competition. Way different. And she's someone that hates not being the favorite. So that really worked in her favor. You know, I think she was kind of a, I don't know, kind of oblivious to that too. Cause she always, she was the one in the room who believed she was gonna win. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe nobody else did, but she did. And that, that was just the, one of the most remarkable things about Tara mm -hmm. was that you just knew that she knew she was going to do, she was going to win. Yeah, and I don't so, think Hubble and Donahue know that. I think that they have uh, so struggled to climb and claw, but they doubt right. themselves too much. Well, you know? It's just, uh, how many times have they been to Worlds? Uh, I want to say about, geez, uh, about four, I would say. Right? Since 14, right? Yeah. yeah. Give them time. If yeah. they want to continue, I mean, I say that a lot about people. Give them time. Because, and I also, you know, it's with ice stance, it, it just, it takes longer. Look how long the ships have been around mm -hmm. doing this. And and um, it, it it came together for them this year. But, um, but you know, yesterday. Um, but I don't know. I think Hubble and Donahue need to make that decision themselves. I don't think we should make it. Mm -hmm. Of course. I mean, and something about the, it's interesting, for me, Hubble and Donahue have more important skating. Uh, it means more to me, perhaps. Uh, it's a real voice, it's unique, and it's profound. Where the Shibs, again, is a little bit more um, on the surface for me. But what I will say is uh, one of my mm, reservations about them in the past is that lack of abandon. Um, and, and they kind of brought that in a surprising way to me during that free dance and created a moment that the arena was really responding to. Yes. Again, it was not my cup of tea, but it did really create an impact, it seemed. And so I was curious how they did that, especially after kind of a couple of rocky events. Hmm. Is it because they did the team event? And having said that, since they insisted on doing both, did they deny Hubble and Donahue working out their their nervy kinks in, in that team event also? I don't know. I think that the competitors who were at the team event last Olympics figured out the benefits. Yeah. You know, because it could be a benefit and it, could, it was a drawback for a lot of people at the last Olympics, but the ones who actually really used it, used right. it wisely. Um, and, and so the others, didn't have that benefit, they didn't get the momentum, they didn't have um, the engagement with the public, they, you know, all of that stuff that worked for the Shibs and worked for Tess and Scott, um, and Adam. Um, and so they really were able to turn that around, all of them, and it, that was a really positive thing. I think with the Shibs, um, I, I get the impression well, I mean, I think with every performance, you're bringing in all your life experiences. Hmm. And and um, I think, you know, with the Shibs, they, they to me, st still seem, you know, like young and sweet and, and not, I don't know this, but not necessarily experienced in life. And, and so until that happens, we're not going to have, you know, the, the richness of, of somebody who has the experience. Earth, yeah, that you know, having said that, you you simply can't deny their technical um, quality. Yeah, I mean they're amazing. Their the, their edge. The interesting thing was that that reliable technical quality really it, it escaped them in the Grand Prix final and at nationals. So I was so impressed that they not only regained it, but regained the confidence also. Right. 
because that that would be the shaky bit from my standpoint. And and so that to me was a real testament to the kind of mental training and approach. And it's one of those things, before they started the free dance, they were skating around, they were making their little heart signs, goofing with the audience, and you thought, okay, they're fine. They're gonna be fine. You could tell in the relaxation that whatever was gonna happen next was going to be very at ease and, and comfortable for that. So. Um, well, I mean, I also have, a huge issue with the Grand Prix, Prix series in Olympic year. I mean, yeah. I just, I just think, who cares? I, I think that whatever, whoever wins the Grand Prix means squat for right. Olympic year. I think it's great for certain skaters, um, you know, who can pace themselves, but I just think the season's too long. I think it's asking for too much. Mm -hmm. And I think that you need to go in and use it, use it. Um, if you're if you're going to compete at all, then use it. And um, for experience, for knowledge, for all of that stuff, and don't kill yourself doing it. Right, right. Yeah, it was interesting. We were talking to Megan, and she was telling us. Um, I don't know if it was before the show, during, after. It's been a long Olympics, but she was saying that with her and Eric, she really felt Eric's confidence grow with their skate at nationals like he didn't really click in that higher gear and then herself click into that higher gear in response until they nailed nationals then that like it really just clicked in for the olympics and you see with the older skaters you know tessa and scott didn't get into that higher gear until they lost the grand prix final and then it just drove them and you could see that right and but you also knew that it was a it was a well paced season. It, it was it was calculated. Mm -hmm. It the wins were not important as important as the other information that they were drawing from it. Mm -hmm. You know whatever that was the feedback on the programs, the you know the costumes, the, you know all the little things. And I also think it's different for the dance event in that it's an easier season to handle when you're competing that much than the singles. Yeah. You know just because of the jumps, and just because of the risk of, of injury from jumps and from throws and all of that stuff. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> what do you think is next for Hanyu or for Adam? You know, what do you think is next for them realistically? Uh, oh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, what do they want to do? Um, you know. Well, apparently not commentate for NBC. <laughs> Well, not this week. I mean, that was yeah. a great. Decision. He wanted to march and be an athlete, and, you know, be at the the closing. And, um, and why and, can't he do both? That was so strange to me that they can't. To be, not, to no, be competing, you, can... you have to give up your accreditation as an athlete. Okay. You can't be both. Okay. Um, so he, why would he do that? I mean, he's got mm. whatever job he wants waiting for him. Mm there and, and why would he give up this lifetime experience yeah um, he can still do a gazillion interviews right and and and, and have that exposure mm -hmm. um, without actually having the job mm -hmm. speaking of commentating miss sandra Besick, i always loved yours what was your take on tanith then oh tanith was i thought she did great yeah fabulous. yeah Fabulous. And it's tricky, and I wonder, again, talking about those replays, if she may have been more silent during the program had she been given the opportunity to watch the replays and discuss during them. But I thought she did a good job of kind of balancing and giving us the information yes. as needed during the program. Yeah. Yes, and, 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 and she did, she, uh, she was fabulous. I mean, there was so much of what she did that I, I loved because she was, very, she was analytical when it was necessary. She was emotional and, and empathetic with the computer. And um, and also she she was, um, her timing was beautiful. And, and, and she did things, like I, I mentioned to you before we started this, is that she um, she she would speak over the, the instrumental portion of the program rather than competing with the lyrics. You know, yeah. she would wait for that moment to say what she had to say. She right. was um, articulate, she was concise, she was brief, um, and 
oh, and she's gorgeous. So she's like this, you know, practically perfect in every way. <laughs> that woman, I, I adore her. The three of us, I don't think Terry is ugly. So that's our <laughs> Terry, well, Terry's a master. I mean, Terry's, you know, yeah. Terry's one of the, the best. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what you're right about that not talking over, because I think the criticism of other commentators this Olympics has been the talking of over of the programs. Well, it's, hard. it's really hard um, to find your spot. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it was something that, that we, and I always hopefully chose not to say anything at all rather than step on, you know, maybe say mm -hmm. too little, rather than step on, you know, either somebody's yeah. moment or somebody's really great piece of music and 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 david michaels who who you know pro was our producer forever i mean we would talk about things like letting the music establish letting the program establish before going in and, and speaking so that you know the audience got a sense of what they were about to see um and the rhythm of all of that and that's also you know stuff you learn over time and you know waiting for the instrumental break as opposed to compete and now it's even harder with lyrics you know to find your spot and not be competing with everything so it's 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 not easy and it's and um you know it's live and you have to have that balance of um having done a ton of homework and things sort of plan to say but then go with the spontaneous spontaneity yeah. of what's actually happening and try and look at it. I mean, you know, the super fan is judging everything you say, but you're also, you also know that you're speaking, especially at the Olympics to an audience who doesn't turn on the TV for fit skating except once every four years. And so you do have to give them information. So it's like, the, uh, it's, it's really, and then you have to work with a partner. And so it's, it, it's a great, I mean, I love, I was scared all the time, um, but I felt really, really privileged um, to have had that spot for that many years and, you know, we're kind of sort of knocked on wood every time the phone rang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you could just tell Tanith puts a lot of homework into it and that she really works to get better. She's had a lot of experience on a smaller you know, hosting and doing all of that stuff. So I think she was just like a, in a perfect place for her um, career to just go and nail these Olympics. She's fabulous. I love having Tanith as a voice of skating. Yeah, yeah she, um, you know, she works volleyball. She does curling. I mean, she's really worked at broadcasting. I really respect that. She's, a, she's, she's you know, honing a craft and mixed metaphor um but um when she was on battle of the blades she was studying she was going to school at the same time and um you know she didn't sit around she just worked studied all her you know spare time that's him and you know it shows mm -hmm. yeah. besides that she's she's just got such a nice way about her and she's gorgeous <laughs> <laughs> It's funny. I know I saw some someone tweeting at you that was yelling at you for commentating when you're not even at the event. And I thought that was one of my favorite moments of the Olympics is when well, I, I was pretty tickled by it because she was mad at me for being so mean. And I tweeted back and said, um, <laughs> I'm sitting in Toronto on my couch <laughs> watching. Yeah. yeah. And then you all you know, and a lot of people kind of, you know, responded with humor mostly and, and or all, and I felt bad for her then. And she, <laughs> but I, but you know, the other thing was then she came back and she says, well, you know, who was that old bitty? I'm thinking, lady, it's 2018. One woman shouldn't call another woman an old bitty. We <laughs> hopefully all become old bitties at some point. <laughs> Oh, you know, I'm like, presuming, you know, she's a young female. Maybe she's an old bitty. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. how? I'm, I'm an old bitty. <laughs> well. So, Sam, ask a bit of a pointed question. Uh, there was a, a lot of uh, speculation about where maybe the Russian ice dance team would end here. 
for girlfriends to love yet. And in general, as we see oftentimes with the Russian singles ladies, and quite a bit in this particular free dance about the blind girl, I don't quite understand what was happening. In that kind of storytelling and pantomiming and all this sort of stuff, where I, who have seen the program several times, am often left confused. I don't understand. It looked like a lady was blind, but outside of that, I, I'm unsure of what story they're telling. Uh, are you a fan of this kind of storytelling and actually pantomiming a scene and creating a mini Shana throughout a four minute scene? Or are you more interested in interpreting the music through a, a more general emotional concept? I think it's, I, I would like to think that I would respond to a piece of music um, and explore different avenues. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, and it depends on the situation, right? I mean, you know, Kurt's clown, I don't know if that was pantomime, but it was, it was different than, you know, something lyrical that, but in a competitive situation, um, I'm, I think those, those, those pieces in general feel dated to me. Yeah. Um, and, 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 yeah. Um, I, I actually didn't pay attention. I, it, they lost me. Mm -hmm. um, Funny, I kept looking at my phone during their performance, and yeah. I was like, "Jonathan, you have to keep watching." And I was like, "Gosh, if just, I can't pay attention to it." Yeah, it wasn't just that. I just, I just don't think they have the quality, the skating quality that the other teams do to back it up. Right. To do something like that, and so. I didn't buy it, um, but you know, sometimes I'll go back and look at something, and think, "Oh, okay. Well, I, you know, I was in the wrong frame of mind when I saw that." Now, as you said, you know, you go back later and and, and um, recognize the quality in something, <laughs> but I don't think I'm going to go back there um, to Bye. check. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I think. Uh... For so many years, you know, there have been different phases. I think that this is this pantomime fad trend is is kind of a new phenomenon. There have been different. I mean, we have to remember that Marina Zueva used to choreograph for Russia. Tamara Moskvina used to have beautiful work throughout the years. But I think it's, you know, some shifting in different styles. And this is not my favorite. But I, I don't think it's representative of all of Russia. But I do think that oh. it's it just a new characteristic. It's a thing. It's a thing. Yeah. Um. And, you know, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm guilty of going down roads I shouldn't have gone down to, <laughs> you know, so sometimes it works that, and sometimes it's worth it, it. Yeah. It doesn't become a formula. Like you're saying, you went right. down a road, you, you try things and that's inevitable. Yeah. Pantomiming right. and ice dance, I don't know, it makes me drink. <laughs> yeah. I, it just, it didn't work for me. And yeah. That's all I can say. Yeah. Now, well, Sandra, having competed at the Olympics. Pardon me? Having competed and done all these things in big competition, when you finish that moment, how much of a release is there for you in, the, in those real final moments of an Olympic moment? Oh, I was 15. You know, I can't answer that question. I barely remember. Um, okay. It was a different, it was, and at, back in that time, at that time, Olympics was not as important as Worlds. Okay. It, didn't, it wasn't an immediate event. It was just getting there. 76 with Dorothy is really when it started, and then, you know, after that. It may have been in the States uh, more so, but felt amongst the skaters that it was really the focus was Worlds, and Worlds were in Calgary. So, and then we were babies, you know, we were going for top 10 and, and that was that. So, and the other thing was we got there so early to train, like three weeks ahead of competing, you know, the team, and then ended up only having like half an hour a day to train on the ice. And then there were times or, you know, two half hour sessions 
Um, and then there were times when we were put on buses to go to rinks like two hours away for our half hour session. And one time the bus went to the wrong rink. So we didn't even get our half hour session. So we felt at in Sapporo, by the time we actually got on the ice, we paired, that we, we could hardly, you know, that we, everything was gone. Yeah. I mean, we, so it wasn't, a, it wasn't this Olympic experience like it, it's been um, since. Hmm. And, uh, and as I said, we were babies. Um, I had to get permission. There was, I think there was an age limit at that time, and I, they had to get me special permission to compete. Um, and flip side was we were in Japan and we were at the Olympics and we were in the team in the village and, you know, meeting everybody and I mean, marching and our, our opening ceremonies was in the afternoon. And, um, I mean, it was all of that. I remember, I remember all of that more than I remember the performance. I remember our short program cause we did really, really well. Um, and I remember, um, well, you know, people said, you know, oh, your mark should have been higher and all that kind of stuff. And I felt like our energy dropped a little for the free program. Like we were so high in the short that, mm. and the day off didn't help us. Anyway, I'm talking way too much about this. Did you <laughs> well, want to continue <laughs> after that? Pardon? Did you want to continue for the next Olympics or were you, you were good? Well, no, no, no. We, we plan to continue. Um, I mean, oh gosh, this is another, you know, two it's... hour conversation, my little life from the time I was, you know, 15 <laughs> till I stopped. I mean, I was, uh, I was this, you know, I was traveling the world at 14, 15, doing exhibitions all over the world, competing, da, 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 sending, you know, my schoolwork in by mail to my teachers and, 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 and by the time, you know, ballet and, da, 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 and dance. You know, every, uh, I was burnt out by mm. 17. Yeah. And, um, you know, just going through all the things that a 17 year old goes through, 16 year old goes through, and, and there was no support system, mm -hmm. zero support system at that time. And so that's why um, when I see somebody like Mirai or, you know, the younger girls, going through you know those dips and things i'm just i really feel for them yeah uh, thank goodness there's a support system now uh, but in you know ours everything was on such a smaller scale but it was still my little life mm -hmm. i'm just intrigued because an ice dance in particular and in particular in this free dance there was so much emotion, so much collapsing on the ice, so many oh, tears oh. at the end. And, I, you know, I hate to be that guy, and yet here I am. Sometimes it seemed more genuine than at other times. You know what I mean? It was like, with certain skaters, you're like, here it comes. Here comes the fake, moved by their own performance, you know. And, and sometimes it must be a real release. I was on... Vancouver, and when the test did its first Nessim Dorma, he, he after he finally finished the first one, he turned up stage and erupted into tears because it's such a, a release. Other times, like, oh my gosh, are you trying to convince us to get to, that it was more artistic than it was? I don't know when it's planned or when it's really genuine. And then, no, back in our day, none of that happened. Okay. Everybody, you you took your eye, you spot. Um, to start, you didn't do the circle, you didn't do the extra, you just, you, a name was announced, you went out, to center ice, and then at the end, you bowed, and then yeah. you left. Anything else that happened, happened off, off the ice. And that went on for, up until, I guess, um, Oksana was sort of the first who started, you know, doing the thing prior to the skate, right? I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but Kevin, when we were watching um, the dance last night, he turned to me and he said, you shouldn't be allowed to fall on the ice unless you're in the last flight. <laughs> it really makes you wonder what Katarina would do now, because Katarina Vid, for as dramatic as she was, did not have theatrics before or after her performance. 
because it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a thing it was frowned upon i mean you were you you held yourself differently and you treated the audience like a audience the minute you stepped on the ice right um, and but some of the you know honest emotions that are expressed are wonderful and you know when when aliona fell on the ice after their skate i mean was there anything more endearing yeah endearing and hard i mean but you know what she deserved it hmm. not everybody deserves it <laughs> um, but you know if you're feeling it you're feeling it Yes, some of them seemed contrived to me, and some of them being genuine. Yeah. And that would be. Well, I'm sure we'll be talking to you throughout the rest of the event, Sandra. This has been so much fun. Yeah. Thank you. you I hope you do some nice, healthy edits. Yes. <laughs>